The history of Chianti is closely related to the wealthy merchant and bankers Florentine families. Chianti, over the centuries, has become synonymous of Italian red wine, but it has been deeply flawed due to poor regulation and quality controls. For that, it was argued that Chianti, it was a style of wine and it doesn't represent the region. With my returning guests, Francis Savino and Bill Nesto, Master of Wine, authors of Chianti Classico, the search for Tuscany's noblest wine, we discussed what has led to this point and most importantly, how Chianti is finally changing to focus on quality and selections after a long history of sharecropping, governo and fiascos, all those discussed in the episode. If you enjoyed this podcast, remember to hit the follow button to know when the next podcast are coming up. Hi, I'm Mattia Scarpazza and this is the Looking Into Wine podcast. Wine and winemaking can be complex, but this podcast has a simple mission. We want to give you the skills and tools to harness your passion about wine. Through this series, we will shine a spotlight on some of the different regions, process and concepts that shape the fascinating world of wine. I hope you're enjoying the show and your own journey, Looking Into Wine. Welcome to the Looking Into Wine podcast. I'm Mattias Carpazza, your host, and today with me are the authors of Chianti Classico, The Search for Tuscany Noblest Wine, a very layered book that traces the history of Chianti Classico. I welcome back to the show Bill Nesto, Master of Wine, and Francis Savino, who were previously guests on the Evolution of Sicilian Wine episode. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Mattia. An honor to be here with you and your listeners. Thank you. It's, it's been fantastic uh, last time and the interview and has been a great success uh, and I'm very happy to have you on the show. And you have uh, the, first, the first book was in, on Sicily and uh, your second book now is on uh, Chianti Classico. What was uh, the inspiration and why did you choose to, to write about Chianti Classico? Well, uh, Fran had been in living in, in Grave in the 1980s and uh, she was actually right in the heart of Chianti Classico and uh, but you know she was uh, really working on her law degree and, and, and improving her Italian living with a family who was really uh, had, had land since the 15th century in Grave farmed land so she, ironically she was there really early but I came to uh, probably Chianti Classico uh, Florence and Chianti Classico was the first uh, zone that I visited in Italy uh, in 1994, probably. The origin, I, th I think Fran and I are both very much attracted to culture, and, and there's no place in, in, in Italy, or the, really Florence and Siena are very high on the list as sort of uh, cultural high points. Fran, what do you think? <laughs> I think as well, um, Mattia, in telling the story of Sicily, we came to understand more profoundly that Sicily shared something with Chianti. In addition to Marsala, Chianti was one of Italy's most famous and esteemed wines in the 19th and perhaps even earlier. Um, but in addition, as a, as a name by the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, it was widely known. Both had become, in a sense, essentially highly branded. But as places, both Sicily and Chianti were largely unknown and misunderstood. And they both have majestic landscapes and fascinating histories, but those histories are laced with complexity and conflict. So after we finished the world of Sicilian wine, Chianti and the, the story of the true Chianti, Chianti Classico, seemed like a worthy challenge for, for our focus. I mean, I read, the, I read most of the book and as I think is uh, the layers of complexity in the history of Chianti is incredible. I mean, it's very entwined with the history of Florence, which is close by. And I think my guess, my first question, why did Chianti was so important for, for Florence? And why, why Chianti? Why planting in Chianti? Well, um, Chianti was, was always known as uh, an area where excellent wines were made. Uh, and just like any uh, important area um, where wine is made, it was sort of trafficked in Florence and Siena in the, in the, in the fairs. And uh, basically, uh, the, the people who were selling Chianti uh, uh, a lot of times were 
uh, there was a lot of sort of phony Chianti, uh, in other words, wine which wasn't, didn't come from Chianti there. And over time, uh, um, what Chianti was um, became sort of um, mysterious in part because Chianti was all, always associated with uh, the Chianti Mountains and an area really roughly defined by Castellina, uh, Rada, and, and parts of Gaioli. And because it didn't have a distinct border, uh, it, it caused confusion and then, of course, the, the mercantile sort of uh, misuse of the word Chianti also made it confusing. But I would say uh, for the Florentines, the landscape of Chianti uh, has really almost mythic or epic significance for it, since Chianti's history is tied up with the history of Florence, and it was essentially a battlefield between the Florentines and the Sienese from the 12th century till Florence conquered it in 1555. And so um, when the Florentines did finally um, assume control of Chianti at the beginning of the 13th century, they formed a military league. And I think this was hard won. And through the centuries, whether it was the Sienese or the Aragonese or the various imperial powers who were in fact waging a proxy war on Chianti's vineyards and in Chianti's hills, Chianti was hard won territory. But as, as we point out, for those people who go to the, the Palazzo Vecchio, the town hall, city hall in Florence, they can see an image personified by a mature Bacchus of Chianti, which signified its reputation in the mid 1500s as being a, re a region known for its excellent wine that had the capacity to age. And I think the reason for that is there was a fundamental appreciation going back to probably the early 1400s or even 1300s, that the, the natural characteristics of Chianti, which were you know, the high hills um, and valleys and rocky lean soil, were well suited to dedicated vineyards that produced wines with higher acidity because of the cooler climate. I mean, as uh, I, was, I was reading, I was standing out on many of these like historic Chianti family they've been around for the last 800 years that they were and there's like they were there but not mostly not to produce wine I know that like they were doing like also other than the waging the war as you were saying and, and it's so fascinating to know that this family they've been around for so long and producing Chianti and so well how did um, Chianti evolved during the early centuries what what was the uh, in the export market, you were saying like the fraud, how did that come about and why did the tarnish almost a bit of the name of Chianti? Well, Chianti is important in part because, of course, it's in more or less the center of Italy. Its evolution sort of represents uh, the evolution of the Italian wine culture and how it looks on the whole issue of terroir. Uh, if one reads our book closely, one realizes that um, really the issue of terroir was fought over. Uh, in, in Tuscany, and the, the, the battle was between uh, uh, wines of place, which was really something that really was originated, or not originated, but evolved to, to be quite strong culturally in France and southern Germany, uh, and uh, wines which uh, really uh, were sort of created in particular wine styles and branded uh, enological wines, one, one might say, um, which was something that uh, seem to have more uh, validity uh, in, in Italy, particularly central Italy. Uh, Piemonte has always had a close, uh, a, a closer uh, relationship with France. And there, actually, uh, in our book, you can see how it was really the Piedmontese who were, uh, took a step forward in identifying place, and, and, and uh, whereas uh, the, the Tuscans hopped onto the bandwagon of Vini Tifici, which was a which was a uh, became a, a legal name uh, in the during the fascist period in the 1920s and 30s um, for uh, wines which really uh, represented wine styles connected to place, but they were pri pri primarily wine styles. And I think the the larger landscape uh, for the understanding of Chianti is really an understanding of the evolution and really devolution of agriculture in, in greater Tuscany and ultimately Chianti. So when we approached this story, Mattia, we asked ourselves, why in a culture like Florence and Siena, 
which had elevated art and architecture and the study of the humanities and the revival of classical learning, including the great agricultural treatises of Pliny and Varro and Columella, why was not wine put on an equal pedestal with those, those other aspects of culture in the same way that happened in France? And so we focused our, our, our research in answering that question on, on agriculture and the system of land tenure that developed in Tuscany generally and ultimately in, in Chianti, but to a lesser extent. And that was the classic Tuscan mezzadria system, which was a form of land tenure that essentially the Florentines in particular perfected for almost seven centuries. So in its initial incarnation in the 1200s, Florentine landholders released out their land and, an alt and initially they actually invested in dedicated vineyards and often reserved the planting intended attending of those vineyards for their own or for salaried workers um, efforts. And then they left for their tenant farmers the cultivation of grain and fruit trees and, and other crops. But with time, it became mm -hmm. much more profitable since this system of sharecropping essentially involved the advancement by the landowner of capital to plant land and then a, a sharing, mezzadria comes from mezzo, half, a sharing of the resulting crop. So it ultimately resulted in a system of mixed planting, which involved principally in lower lying areas in Chianti and throughout most of Tuscany, tree trained vines as opposed to vines and specialized vineyards that were trained on stakes and given the kind of careful cultivation that's necessary for quality wine. And this became a highly profitable way for managing the land. And the Florentines, as you know, perfected contracts, perfected, you know, perfected double entry bookkeeping, and they brought that know-how of commerce to their countryside, but ultimately became a system that stifled agricultural innovation and led to poor quality grapes and poor quality wine. And the exception really through the mid 16th century were the high elevation areas in Chianti. And those high elevation areas were still making wines from high sites involving dedicated vineyards and producing higher quality wine. And those were in the, in the Chianti classical area. I would... Correct. Yeah, but you know, uh, even today, uh, working, you find very little Florentines and Sienes working in vineyards. Uh, agricultural work is looked on as sort of the lowest form of work. And, and, and basically, family members who go in uh, are starting to go into work uh, in, in wineries, but it's usually at the, the high man managerial level or, you know, in marketing. But uh, uh, Tuscans are not connected to agriculture. They, 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 they were, you know, they made their money in banking and, and, and things like silks. And, and when finally those sources of revenue dried up and they realized they had to make uh, their money from agriculture, uh, agriculture was looked on as something that only the lowest echelons of society did. Um, whereas if you go up to Piemonte, the story is completely different. You have family members uh, working in the fields, coming up, taking an active role. So it's a it's 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 really uh, eviscerated. Uh, uh, basically, uh, the, the, the Tuscan culture has sort of disassociated itself from agriculture in a way which is very harmful to um, the development of a society which where 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 agricultural expressions are expressions of terroir. I mean, when uh, when this uh, shift from the mezzadria when the mezzadria sort of finished and when there has been the shift towards uh, making single crop vineyards. So when, when did this happen? What sort of period are we talking about? Well, the, the, basically the devolution of the, of the uh, messagery system uh, began in the 1950s. It really was accelerated dramatically in the 1960s and early 70s. And by the mid 80s, um, there were virtually no messagery left. It was, it was a kind of uh, population which, which really was looked down on by Florentines, there were like two classes of people. There were the mezzadri, and 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 then there was the, the sort of the, the typical people of the area. They dressed differently, um, uh, and they looked. You see pictures. There's a great picture uh, in in our in our book, um, and and which which has a, a mezzadri family pictured 
um, next to uh, landowners, and you can see how different it is. Oh, from the Pomona. The, the, the Villa Pomona. And it's, uh, yeah, so I, I saw it in the book actually today. I was having a, 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 a read through again, and I saw actually the book. And I mean, for me, it's just, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's in, so interesting to understand it and Chianti in, the, in Tuscany, how it's like recent actually the shift has been. Right. It's only been around for like 70 years, and the history goes back uh, from hundreds of years and been making Chianti wine for centuries. And how did the uh, also, like other decision that led to the sort of demise of Chianti that ultimately is changing now, it was like the the fiasco. Well, how, well, how did that not help? Basically, the, the flask. Well, the fiasco was an was an evolution of of a, a misunderstanding, really, of what Baron or Castle did in the uh, 18, 1840s to 1870s. Uh, uh, it was his version, the sort of the kind of wine that was in the fiasco was his his version of common wine from the area. Uh, his own, the, the wine he made for uh, his his clients from his own estate grapes was was basically uh, at least eighty percent Sangiovese, with the balance being Caniolo. Was was not made in uh, with a Governo, which is a an, an addition of sweet must, which gave it a slight fizz. Um, uh, and 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 the the shape of the fiasco, um, which really was a beautiful shape. I actually loved the the, the, the fiasco and with the straw bottle that came from uh, the late Middle Ages. And you know there are frescoes you can see in Florence from the 15th century where you know they're carrying around fiascos. But um, so the fiasco wasn't the problem in one sense, but it was the problem in another sense. It was so identifiable for branding purposes that you could see it immediately and say that's Chianti. And, and so however beautiful and historic the fiasco was, uh, as, a, as a container, it became the downfall of Chianti the wine um, because it, it became the uh, container for just wine, which really was the creation of, of dis disenfranchised, of, of really owners who didn't play any role in the making of the wine. Um, uh, uh, and Benzadri, who really, really didn't care, and uh, it, it created a style of wine which was very cheap, and 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 became uh, was very easy to drink, uh, and and had limitations as far as true quality and longevity were concerned. And longevity is a key factor in 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 the quality of wine, whether wine can uh, persevere in it. Um, I mean. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, much like the, the name Chianti, the flask, I mean, it, it used to represent an iconic place and an iconic wine. But the adoption of the name, the adulteration of the wine by merchants, both within and outside Chianti, beginning in probably the first decade of the 1600s, led to essentially a dilution and tarnishment of the name Chianti, of the reputation of Chianti wine, and the flask is a part of that story. So unlike, for example, the form of the Coca-Cola bottle, which is unique to the product Coca-Cola and is protected by trademark law, the flask had no such protection. And as Bill said, it increasingly was filled with, with uh, cheap red wine from all over Italy. And, and therefore effectively damaged the, the reputation of Chianti. And Chianti went from being an iconic wine to a generic wine. I mean, in the book, there was a, it transpired this, uh, the difference between the Chianti Classico and the Chianti, the fight they had over the centuries to, to sort of Chianti Classico, they wanted to separate themselves and Chianti, they want to be part of the them and there was a quote uh, which was uh, basically saying that Chianti is a style of wine and is not a wine of a specific zone and that sort of really I think it was uh, the key point of all like what made me think about the whole this fight that they had and how how did this solve like when did Chianti finally separate from Chianti Classico when, when this separation happened and what the resulted? Well, the, the interesting thing is that uh, there was always confusion. And, you know, we, we went back and did some research in the early 18th century in Siena da Balia. There was, uh, there was uh, a, which was a council of 
of the seeing these politicians and landowners. And, and uh, this was at the time when it, it was about to be announced of the 1716 Bondo, which would basically uh, put a lot of Sienese production outside Chianti. And, and the same issues were, were brought up then, is that, hey, look, we've been making Chianti too. Um, our wine is Chianti. This is not fair. So, so the, you know, this, this problem of what is Chianti and what isn't uh, is ancient. Uh, and it, it comes partly from the fact that Chianti um, is, is a frontier. And even when you go to Chianti, uh, it's sort of circled by highways. There are no major railroads that go through it. And, and historically, it was always a no man's land, a, a rocky place where it was hard to even grow things. And, and, and so um, it, it sort of, you know, uh, really w was unable to uh, identify itself. In fact, there was a ra railroad that tried to be a, a sort of a, a channel for Chianti, what I call the Tranvia. And, and that never took root. It, it was basically phased out in the 1930s. But, and, and Ricasoli had to send his wine, uh, you know, initially by, uh, by, by, by horse and carriage and then by lorry. Uh, and so Chianti didn't have a, have a means to uh, identify itself. It was really defined by the perimeter. And on the perimeter, there were merchants who basically did ba make Chianti as they pleased. So what Bill is alluding to, Mattia, um, with respect to uh, the 1716 Bando, is the fact that the Grand Dukes of Florence from the 1600s and early 1700s understood that Florence was no longer the epicenter of commerce and finance, and that ultimately its wealth needed to increasingly come from agriculture and the fruits of the land, specifically wine. And because Chianti, again, beginning in the early 1600s, was often emulated and adulterated and was compromising the ability of the Florentine state and the Grand Duchy of Tuscany to export Florence wine, which Chianti was often called on the English market, there was this, this law, this executive decree passed in 1716. And I'll fast forward, but I'll just say that that law both uh, created a regulatory system and delimited four principal prestigious wine regions within the Florentine state, Chianti being first among them. And the promulgation of that law and the context for it is the subject of a historical mystery, a detective story which ends our book called The Medici Code. When we were outlining our research for Piero Antonori, he said, this is fascinating. It could be a thriller. And we said, yes, like the Da Vinci Code. And you know, we had that in mind as we did it, our research. But fast forwarding to the end of the 19th century, when much of this history dating from the early 1700s was apparently long forgotten, the production of Chianti by, by growers and the sale of it by merchants with the arrival of railroads uh, was becoming industrialized. As Bill said, particularly on the periphery, in Pontefisieve to the northeast of Florence and Poggibonsi to the southwest of Florence, where there was easy access for merchants of wine to ship Chianti both internally to Italy and ultimately for export. And it's in that context that there were the kind of the seeds of this discord were, were planted probably most firmly. Because this, this conflict between the true Chiantigiani, the growers within historic and geographic Chianti and these merchants from outside Chianti began to take root. And the larger landscape for it in the late 1880s and 1890s was that this was a time when the European powers were beginning to memorialize the concept of designations of origin and geographical indications on agricultural products like wine. And so the issue of what is Chianti by the first decade, really the last decade of the 1800s and first decade of the 1900s, became a subject of intense uh, commercial, political, and legal debate. And that debate, we would submit that one cannot understand the evolution of either Italian wine law or more importantly, Italian wine for your listeners and all lovers of wine without understanding this fight. Because as Bill pointed out, this, this fight pitted the merchants who wanted 
the law, Italian wine law, to embrace marketplace typicity or vino tipico, as Bill described earlier, as opposed to the French concept and the concept that the Chantigiani wine growers were putting forth, which was a true typicity of place. And again, which was already conceptualized and which was the, the first appellation of origin of wine law in the world in that 1716 degree decree, which was a typicity that looked at the place of origin, the quality of the wine, and the reputation. Ultimately, the merchants won that fight, and that was memorialized in the 1932 fascist decree, which defined Chianti as, as a a grand area that encompassed most of Tuscany, with Chianti Classico only representing one of seven subzones. I mean, it's it's, it's fascinating this uh, this story. I was, like this historic area is so battled uh, between the commerce and the the, mon the money side and the, the historical side and the value that is this fight and the the is still there and I believe. Um, but also in the last. Uh, hundred years so, so much have changed it as um, as you say that there's a 1930 the decree and but also like then i wanted to ask uh, how this uh the thrive of uh, like big igt wines uh, like the most famous uh, wines from the chianti area have not been branded as chianti well how this came about what the, the problem was was that uh, the image of Chianti had descended so much in the 1960s and 70s that Tuscany uh, at this time was getting a much better image. I mean, fashion, uh, Gucci, all these, you know, Tuscany was becoming, uh, particularly Florence, was becoming a high fashion, very luxury oriented place. But um, uh, they needed a wine uh, to fit that whole sort of standard and uh, a wine where profit could be made. And so basically that's where the Super Tuscan category, which initially was a category without a place in the Appalachian system. It was a vino de tavola. Um, later in 1992, um, Law 164 created the EGT category. Some of those Super Tuscans became EGTs, some of them became DOCs, some of them became, became DOCGs, whatever, wherever they went. But um, the, the problem was, was that Chianti didn't become a, wasn't a profitable vehicle and wasn't a vehicle that suited the status of, of what, of, of really the resurgence of, of Florence as a very important center of culture. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't fall. And uh, also with the, the, this IGT came through some of the most infamous winemakers of uh, the last centuries in Italy, um, Takis, uh, Giacomo Takis doing the Sassicaia and Tignanello. How, how him and also another winemaker that you mentioned in the book, uh, Giulio Gambelli, how did they shape the modern Chianti and what, what was their influence? One of, the, one of the themes of our book is that Italy has always looked to France. There's always been waves of, of French enological influence in Italy. Um, because the, the Italians have always looked up to France, with, with good reason, for their enological uh, and viticultural prowess. And it, so at this time, again, uh, Tuscany looked to France, and uh, they looked to France, particularly through the channel of the Antonori family, uh, Giacomo Takas, who brought in Emile Peinot, uh, and, and uh, in came uh, French Bariques, in came Merlot, Cabernet, uh, different, different ways of doing viticulture. Uh, and so it was, it, this was another time uh, when French technology came in like a wave uh, and, and sort of rejuvenated um, for a time um, uh, the wines of Tuscany. I don't know, if, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. It, may, it, make, uh, it makes sense. And uh, I think, I think it's, uh, if, if such a complex topic the the recent history of Tuscany and I'm trying to untangle it and make it understandable how there is this there was this uh, bad position of counting and that allowed to create and I think uh, paraphrasing that that created the opportunity to create this Tignanello and the Sassicaia and the Super Tuscans coming through but also when you're mentioning about the grape varieties I was reading on your book uh, I was I love the story of Sangiovese how at some point, it wasn't even the main grape variety of Tuscany. Well, how, how did that change? Well, I think 
Uh, we mention a manuscript and an author dating from the mid-16th century who's basically unknown and um, forgotten about. We can try and figure out why, but, but at any rate, um, it seems like uh, he was just at, the, at a point where the Metzadria system um, uh, became hardened. And the Metzadria system um, really depended on Metzadri, who had no, who weren't interested in making great wine, and and uh, landowners who weren't interested in knowing how to make great wine, uh, and 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 the result was a move away. Our thesis is a move away from the great wines of Chianti, which were based on Sangiovese, or Sangiovetto they called it, and and this is a a, a thesis which up to. I think we're the only ones who's presented it, and uh, it's it's interesting that it, it hasn't been challenged because it's a revolutionary thesis that that but basically uh, it wasn't Ricasoli who uh, really discovered uh, uh, the primacy and promoted the primacy of Sangiovese. Um, it was this other uh, uh, farmer in the mid 16th century, and um, uh, even Ricasoli. Uh, really uh, depended on uh, 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 Giorgio Perrin, who was a, uh, the, the former owner of Petrolo, what's now Petrolo, uh, who had isolated Sangiovese as, uh, as, as, the, as the best variety in his property. So um, we've basically rewritten the history of, of, of County Classico. But as I underline again, it's sort of amazing that, that this um, revolutionary sort of uh, contention has not been challenged, but we're we're, we, we want to learn, you know. We, this book for us is not uh, a uh, the end of our research. We're we're looking for more excitement and interest to 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 be created from it. So, Mattia, in our experience, and it, it's remarkable to this day, if you ask some of the most experienced people, be they producers or officials of the consortium, about the history of the appellation, they will put forth a narrative that describes the wine of Chianti being a vermiglio, a red wine principally made of canaiolo. Um, maybe uh, it was treated with a governo, and Bill can describe that a bit more. And as Bill indicated, that it was in the mid 19th century when Chianti and Tuscany's noble variety was first singled out. That is the narrative. And yet what that narrative masks, because so often history is written by its patrons in the same way that art is so largely religious in nature because its patrons were ecclesiastical institutions. But when you peel back the veils of history, what we discovered is that at the height of the Renaissance, in high elevation sites and liminal growing areas of Chianti, that indeed it was Sangiovese as the noble variety. And that Vermiglio was a wine, but it was made in areas outside of Chianti by Mezzadri, by the sharecroppers who planted Canaiolo up trees, because Canaiolo, I think, is early ripening, right? They probably got more volume. Their economic incentives, obviously, were prized quantity over quality. Um, and so I think that is one of the biggest revelations in our book. Canelo was easy to also much easier to dry, to make dry grapes. And Canelo and Malvasia were really important constituents of, of Insanto, um, which was uh, really the grape of the Mezzadro primarily. It's, it's what the Mezzadro harvested before the major crop. And, and so he didn't divide it with the um, with the owner. And this was, of course, always a, an issue of contention um, with the owner about the grapes that disappeared prior to the harvest, but, but they were dried and um, they had two uses, these grapes. Um, one was for Vinsanto, the other, the other one was to use as a governo. So, so the, the Mezzadri were perfectly positioned to make vermigli because they also had the governo, which was sort of like a, 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 a sort of an, an additive which could give more, uh, a second fermentation, which gave more alcoholic content, but also a little spritz, a little fermentation aroma. Uh, and so it was the Mezzadri, the Mezzadri system, which created Chianti, the Chianti, not the Chianti families in the end, or the, the, the Chianti that became worldwide. And the, the Mezzadri, the culture of the Mezzadri evaporated in the 1960s. So something else had to take its place. Okay, and so basically you were saying and then back in the days the canaiolo would be wine based on canaiolo would be still be called Chianti 
for hundreds of years and the Sangiovese of uh, Castellina, Radda, and all these areas, uh, they would be still Chianti. There was not this div diversification among them and uh, it's st uh, uh, buffering almost. <laughs> yes, uh, it's very interesting. To, I mean, on the last um, decades, on the last 20, and actually since this uh, Chianti uh, 2000, and there was uh, this part of uh, the the book and it was the, the last 20 years there's been this strong revival of Chianti and uh, they're trying to make it the differentiation and they created the pyramid system you have the grand selezioni and on the top how this new wave how, what do you think about this new classification this new embracing of quality for Chianti classical what what, what is it doing they followed was was basically occurred in the 1990s and early 2000s most of the research and also the last half of the 1980s and and that followed the super tuscan revolution it was the money that came in through into the wine industry through the super tuscan revolution which really helped um, uh, give drive maybe money directly to these uh, uh, to this research and and the research was interested really helped um, Tuscans really refocus on the raw materials, and and this was a good thing. In the end, they refocused on Sangiovese uh, and its supporting varieties and viticultural systems in a scientific way, and the studies were very well done. Unfortunately, climate change was also occurring uh, very dramatically this time, and for instance, they were selecting um, uh, early ripening clones of. Sangiovese when they maybe should have been selecting late ripening clones because the climate was changing dramatically. Well, dramatically from the perspective of a farmer, not from probably someone who lives in the city. But, but, uh, but um, that, that really was uh, a, a, a major uh, force then. Um, and, and so that, going into the um, 2000s, mid-2000s, there was a move away from the style of wine, which characterized the 1990s, which was much influenced by, by the addition of Merlot, French varieties, Barriques. In other words, an overuse of French technology, mostly to please the American market, which was the most important market. And this sort of, again, much to the credit of Tuscany and Chianti, but they were really responding to the market too. Um, there was a move away from this, and the Chianti 2000 project came just at the right time to, to help fuel the move back to back to a more traditional sort of style of Chianti, um, Chianti Classico, which, which today is, is, in my view, what reigns uh, over the sort of the, the, the more international Super Tuscan style. Perhaps you could actually even add about the evolution of the Super Chianti, the 100% Sangiovese wines that, you know, predated the advent of, of the Gran Selezione and now the Subzone. Well, there, there, was always a, there was always a move to, you know, the crazy thing was, was that in the 1970s and 80s, you couldn't make Chianti Classico without having white grapes in it. In fact, until 2006, actually. Um, uh, well, in 2006, they were actually disallowed. But it, it, it maybe it went back to 1996 or something when when you you couldn't make theoretically Chianti Classico with having white grapes in it, um, and and so um, there were some um, basic problems um, uh, with the laws, uh, and and these had to be corrected. Ironically, um, Bettina Ricasley and this this sort of writer, this farmer, which that we discovered. Uh, uh, who was writing in the mid 16th century? Um, um, their recipe is the recipe of today's great Grand Selezione. So, the like Ricaso Leon not only created the, the original recipe, but he also re updated and rewrote it. He updated himself basically with the new updated version of the Grand Selezione recipe. Right, but also wines from estates like Montevertine in the 19, late 70s and 80s that were technically mm. not Chianti Classico, made of 100% Sangiovese from high elevation sites, um, became iconic. Yeah. Um, and so I think the world began to take notice and there were many estates, uh, right, or a handful yeah. that started making these 100% Sangiovese wines, which of course were a counterpart to Brunello di Montalcino 
that had staked its claim on 100% Sangiovese. And I think Chianti Classico was showing its potential, um, which is even probably greater now because of those climate yeah. changes Bill alluded to. For and Giulio, Giulio Gambelli was the champion of Sangiovese, yes. and he was the champion of these 100% wines, when made in a more traditional Italian way, and that's where Tancredi Biondi Santi comes in, who was the teacher of Giulio Gambelli. He wasn't a student of Giacomo Tac, of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, Emil Pano. Uh, Emil Pano. He was a yeah. student of, of, uh, of, of Tac. Yes, they, yeah, sorry. Oh, Gambelli did, he did uh, do the Pergole Torte, Monte Vetri, in, uh, on the first uh, super, hundred, super tourist hundred percent uh, Sangiovese. I mean, I got the last question for you, which comes from one of my listeners, because, uh, I mean, this is after you've published your book and uh, I mean the the thing about Gran Selezione has always been until recently has always been about the state not the place but now finally there's there's fi only recently they're doing the parcel from a particular particular villages and the the sub zoning of the Chianti Classico what what do you what do you think about that if you if you can express your ideas about it well, you know, the, the movement's in the right direction. I think there's always a, a, a um, um, uh, the movement's in the right direction. Um, there, there's always a, uh, a conflict between um, big merchants and small growers. And, uh, uh, and, and the movement of the grand selection was sort of a compromise between the needs and desires of, of big merchants and those of small growers. Um, but uh, the, the UGAs is another step in the direction of making place important. And so uh, we're positive about it. And we're also positive in making uh, the grand selection category and the UGAs, because now they're, for the moment, uh, uh, the, the, to have the UGA name on your label, you have to be ground selection for the moment. The idea is that it'll it'll filter down to uh, the reserve and anata categories. But uh, in this category, the wines will also be uh, at least ninety percent Sangiovese, and the balance will be non-native. Will be native um, uh, red grapes. Will be the first time in history that Chianti became becomes officially a wine of uh, a terroir or a particular area. I mean, on the label as well, it's always been, but. It would, it would be the first time and then the law upset it and it, it was, it's exciting to see because as a, as of now the, with the last uh, few years the recognition of the quality of uh, the Chianti Classico has been growing especially among like uh, critics and these sort of things so for me is is a good sign of the of this future then it's coming across and I'm quite looking forward to see what, what's happening, what, what will happen with Chianti. I mean, we, we spend 40 minutes now chatting about Chianti and I know there's more stories to be told and, and but there's much more on your book and I, I really enjoyed reading it and I mean there's so much story and there's also the part of uh, the grape varieties. I, I loved when you were talking about the clones of uh, San Giovese in the book is such an interesting topic and I think there's so much to, to learn for every sort of wine uh, lovers from a very someone who's new to Chianti or someone who's very an expert on Chianti can always find something interesting so for me it's a very good balance and I want to thank you to, to come in on today and talk to me. Mattia we want to thank you for looking into Chianti Classico and looking more importantly into the true Chianti, because as you know, it is a, in a magnificent region um, that's long deserved to be known by its own name, Chianti. In this episode, we spoke to Francis Savino and Bill Nesto, Master of Wine, authors of the book Chianti Classico, The Search for Toscanis, Novel's wine. If you'd like to reach us, you can do so on Instagram on, on Looking Into Wine and Mattias Capazza on all other social media. Music produced by Samuele Di Nardo, editing and mastering by Tommaso Ascoli. 
This holiday season, we all wish for hope and healing. Children and families who spend their holidays at the hospital deserve a reason to believe in first steps, in giggles, high fives, and hugs. For 150 years, Children's National Hospital has provided world-class care and groundbreaking research. Please donate today to help patients and healthcare heroes this holiday season. Visit childrensnational.org slash holiday. That's childrensnational.org slash holiday.